Well, um, during the 10 days, uh, one of our elders said to me, um, I won't tell you which one, uh, but his initials are Billy Santosario. Billy said to me, uh, you know, Pastor, you're, you're not a bad guy, you're okay, but you have really cool friends. And um, I said, you're right, I do have really cool friends. And um, one of the coolest of those friends is with us this morning. Uh, Ariel Blumenthal is our missionary from central Connecticut uh, to Jerusalem. I first met Ariel when he was Lawrence uh, in the early 1990s. So we've been friends for over 25 years. We worked together uh, to help lead and pull together the first March for Jesus in the city of Hartford. I think it was 1993. And 5,000 people uh, marched through the streets of Hartford, uh, praising the name of Jesus, dozens and scores of different churches from around the area. And it was a glorious time. Now, um, it wasn't so glorious for Lawrence's family, because Lawrence's surname is Blumenthal. And what was a good Jewish boy doing leading a march for Jesus? But Jesus had met him in Japan, saved him, brought him to a knowledge of himself. And a year later, after, a year after he was baptized in the China Sea by a Korean pastor off the coast of Japan, he was leading a march for Jesus in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, that's a pretty cool friend right there. <laughs> He's since been trained at Yale Divinity School and also in rabbinics at Jewish um, Theological Seminary in New York. And um, he felt the call of God to go to Jerusalem to join the Messianic body of Messiah in uh, the Holy Land, in Jerusalem itself. He's been a missionary uh, to the Far East, living in Japan. Uh, he's fluent in Japanese. He's pretty good in Chinese and can kind of make his way with Korean. So he's a pretty smart guy. But most of all, um, he loves the Lord, and he's a friend to the people of God. And I'm just so excited that we've got ongoing relationship with Ariel, with his family. They're here with us now because um, Israel went into lockdown a couple weeks ago, and they f he just felt uh, the push of God to uh, get out of the country while they could uh, before the, all the borders were closed. And he's been here visiting his mom with his family. And it's just our privilege uh, to be able to host him today. So would you join me in welcoming Ariel Blumenthal? Thank you, Pastor Rick. Thank you. Wow. Good morning. It's great uh, to be home. This is really our, our, as a family, we feel when we come back here to the States, which is not that, not that often, that this is our home. And it's great to see a few faces here and to see all, sort of see all of you out there and behind the screen. I'm excited uh, to be behind a pulpit. It's my first time in 10 months, I think, or nine months, because we went into lockdown and all kinds of changes in Israel, just like you hear starting in Mar uh, late February, early March. Since then, our congregation in Jerusalem, we've been meeting by Zoom, we've been meeting in, in parks, uh, all kinds of things, but uh, it's been great to be here in the sanctuary, even with a few people, uh, and to be sharing the Word of God. Um, thank you for all of your prayers and support for us as a family in Israel. We appreciate it. It's a, a living connection with this living body here at Wellspring. And we pray for all of you. We think about you. Wish we could get here more. And uh, when the skies open again or open more, we look forward to seeing some of you in Israel. I want to say things like, how many of you have been to Israel? But it's not going to be going to work with just a few people here. Um, Today, I want to share a message uh, about the Sabbath or Sabbaths and about the feasts. I know uh, here at Wellspring, you just finished your 10-day 
uh, intensive prayer uh, between Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, Biblical Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. I know you've been doing that for what, 10 years, maybe? Something like that. Part, yeah, 14 years, even longer. Uh, and that there is uh, great interest all over the world in this whole topic of the bib biblical feast, the biblical calendar. Uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem, we see a lot of it. There are all kinds of groups, teachings, and Jewish roots, and Hebrew roots, and, and biblical calendars, and people who come uh, from many nations. Uh, I have a lot of ministry, Rick mentioned, in the, in the Far East, uh, in Japan, China, and Korea. We, see, we were seeing, before COVID-19, thousands of Chinese, for example, coming up to Israel all the time, but especially during uh, the feast Passover, Shavuot, Pentecost, and especially this time of year right now, we're in the Feast of Tabernacles uh, during Sukkot. This year, of course, it's empty, and even the Jewish people in Israel, we have to stay at home uh, in our little sukkah, in our little uh, tabernacle. It's against the rules to even entertain anybody else, which is a real difficult thing because a, a big part of the Feast of Tabernacles is to visit and have people over and eat and drink out there in the in the sukkah. Um, so it's a hot topic, and it's something that uh, we, we think about. It's something I teach about. Uh, I wrote a book called One New Man about the whole reconciliation, unity of Jew and Gentile in Christ. I have a, uh, an appendix about, about the feasts. Um, so it's something I've, had, I've thought a lot about and taught uh, about. Today I want to teach about it from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, and first, think about why, you know, what does the New Testament have to say about this subject of the feasts and whether we should be keeping them or observing them. Must we? Should we? Maybe it's a good idea. Some people say yes. Some people say no. There's a lot of different opinions out there. And uh, when you ask that question, you find out, well, sure, Jesus kept the feasts and uh, Saul, Paul, he also made certain appointments to go back to Jerusalem during the feasts. Okay, they did that. They were Jews. That was normal. That was part of their life for centuries, just as it is today, still for the Jewish people. Uh, it's our, in Israel, it's our national calendar. I mean, it's a kind of a, if you say, do Israelis keep the feasts? It's like asking Americans, do you keep Thanksgiving? You know, it's like everybody does, you know. Um, and uh, they did that, but there's not a lot of teaching about, well, what about the Gentiles? Should they keep the feast? Should they not? Do they need to? There's, there's a few hints here and there. But what we do find is that there's a lot of teaching in the New Testament about the Sabbath. Have you noticed that? Right? There's several places in the Gospels where there's controversies and Jesus debating, arguing with the Pharisees about what the Sabbath means and how it's supposed to be kept or not kept Right? He says eventually at one place, I, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Right? Uh, also in, in the letters, and we'll see, we're going to focus especially on uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 3 and 4. There's some really, really deep teaching about the Sabbath. So how does the Sabbath connect to the feasts? I want to look at our first scripture, which is Leviticus chapter 23, um, verses 1 and 2. And I understand they'll be on the screen uh, just below me somewhere here or something, right? The bottom third, West told me. Uh, Leviticus chapter 23, if you want to study about the feasts and their prophetic meaning and, and the, the whole sort of uh, uh, format of what happens and what's supposed to happen, Leviticus 23 is the chapter. Most detailed, it's a whole chapter just on this subject of the feasts, okay? And I want us to look at that because we find something very, very interesting about the feasts in the first two verses. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. The Lord spoke again to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, this is the word moed, moadim in Hebrew, a very special word, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. My appointed times are these. Ready? Here are the appointed feasts and times. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. You shall not do any work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all of your dwellings. So what do we learn here? Before 
Moses, before God through Moses speaks anything about the feasts of Jehovah, the feasts of Yahweh, right, this whole calendar, he establishes something very clearly, that the first and greatest and most important feast and the foundation of the whole calendar, the whole thing is the seventh day Sabbath, right? So that helps us when we say, oh, okay, the New Testament doesn't do a lot of specific teaching about the Passover and what it, how it, whether or not you're supposed to keep it. Of course, there's a lot of things that happened on Passover during Passover week and how Jesus fulfilled that. But it does have a lot to say about the Sabbath. So we learn from Levit- Leviticus 23, whatever theology, whatever faith, practice you want to develop around the feasts, you need to get first an understanding of the Sabbath. And whatever, you, whatever the Bible teaches about the Sabbath in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, that's essentially what it's saying to us also about the feasts, okay? That's why I wanted to just start there with this verse in Leviticus 23. Let's jump for the rest of our time uh, to the New Testament. And we're going to look at two places in particular. One is John chapter 5, and the other is Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. And here, I'm going to, the, the, the title of this message, and what I see, and what I see the most important teaching about the Sabbath and the feasts from these two places, I call it working restfully and resting workfully. Now, Rick said, you know, I, I'm pretty good at languages, but um, I know workfully is not a, a word in English, okay? I was born and raised here. Uh, but I made it up, okay? Resting, uh, working restfully and resting workfully. Okay, that's what we're going to do. There's something about this dynamic in the Bible between what's called work and what's called Sabbathing. There's another word I made up. Okay, I'm, and I, I do that purposely because in Genesis, actually where it says, and God rested on the seventh day, in Hebrew, it's the same word as the Sabbath. It's a verb. He Sabbathed. Vuhu yishbot, okay? So it's all, a pl- all these words come from the Sabbath. The he Sabbathed, we say rested. But we're going to see that it's, well, it's not that God, you know, had a tough day, tough six-day work week and decided that he needed to rest on the seventh day. Did anybody think that? We'll look at that later also. Okay, so let's see how these two things fit together in John chapter 5 and Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 to see how God is working restfully and resting workfully and how he's calling us into that same kind of faith, the same kind of balance. Okay, Um, let me just say at the beginning before we kind of delve into these scriptures that uh, Hebrews emphasizes the rest side. You'll see it talks about an eternal rest, this eternal Sabbath, this place that God is calling us into. And John chapter 5 hits the other side. You know the story? Yeah, in John chapter 5, it's one of the sort of pinnacles of the whole, of Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees, right? Right? He goes up to Jerusalem, it says, on a feast. It doesn't tell us which one. Some different opinions, but it's interesting. A connection there with the feasts. And he goes to the pools of Bethesda. Makes me think of President Trump. Isn't there a hospital in Bethesda, Maryland or something? Is that where he is? Where is, yeah, Bethesda. Nice connection. We pray. I agree. We would pray for complete healing for President Trump. We love President Trump in Israel. He's done great and amazing things for Israel, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, something which was decided by the American people back in the 90s. Did you know that? Yeah? The Congress passed a law saying, we recognize... I'm, I'm diverging a little bit. It's okay, right? Just so. um, and, uh, and presidents, one after the other, Republican, Democrats said, no, no, we can't do that, we can't do that, we can't do that. It doesn't matter. The American people decided it's too controversial Along comes Donald Trump and says it's time. And he moved it. Profound implications for the whole world, for the Middle East. And then what's just happened in the last month 
these peace treaties, these normalization with Air, with Bahrain, with the United Arab Emirates, the Israeli people, and we're jumping, you know, we're jumping off of our screens, off of our sofas in the living room during lockdown. But we're so excited and, and uh, appreciative of uh, our American president. And I was reading the Israeli news in Hebrew this morning. It's number one. Everyone's praying for him. Everyone's wishing him well that he gets over COVID-19 quickly. Amen. Back to John chapter 5. So at this place are a people who are lame, sick, and blind. And there's a tradition. Was it real? Did it? I don't know, but it says every once in a while, at certain seasons, the waters would start sort of uh, churning, and that was supposedly an angel that was visiting, and whoever got into the waters quickest, I don't know if it was just one person or a few people, yeah, got healed, right? So Jesus goes up there, and he sees this man who's been lame, or a sickness, it doesn't say what, what kind of sickness, I'm assuming he was some kind of lame, because he had to take up his pallet and walk, yeah, I don't think he could walk, uh, and it says he was sick like that for 38 years. That's a long time. Probably since his youth. Some accident, some sickness. We don't know. By the way, we'll see the connection with this number 38 years. This is something I never noticed before when we jump to Hebrews 3 and 4, which focuses on Psalm 95 and the experience of the children of Israel in the wilderness, which was for how long? 40 years, about. But it says in Deuteronomy 2, 14, that it was 38 years. There's probably not, it's probably not coincidence. God's trying to connect these two things uh, in the Spirit, in the, in, in the Word of God, as we'll see. So he's there for 38 years. Jesus walks up, says, do you want to be made well? The guy says, well, I, 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 uh, you know, every time I, 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 the waters churn up and I can't get in there quick enough and someone else gets ahead of me, and I, I've been here 38 years. And Jesus says, take up your pallet and walk. This didn't depend on this guy's faith. This was 100% Jesus just saying, this is God. God's going to do it. Take up your pallet and walk. He jumps up. He's healed. He starts walking around. The next thing that happens is the Pharisees, some of the leaders of the Peoshim, especially in Jerusalem, oh, they were tough. Every time I read it, I'm in, I think, oh, I'm embarrassed to be Jewish. God. I mean, here's this guy. He's been sick for 38 years. And they see him running and happy. And the first thing they say is, don't you know, on the Sabbath, our rules say you're not supposed to carry your pallet. We have Sabbath rules and rules and rules, you know, in Judaism. Uh, we live in downtown Jerusalem. And... Uh, we live in an area that's pretty mixed, but there's a lot of uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews. And just, you know, you can walk a few hundred yards from our neighborhood, sort of across this piece of downtown, and you're in Mea Sherim, which is the, the ultra-Orthodox, you know, black. Everyone is in black and white, black and white, black and white. And if you, by mistake, and this has happened to some friends, if you rented a car when you came to Israel, and you on the Sabbath day, starting Friday night, right, you buy, get lost or your GPS doesn't work. That happened. It was you. Oh, it's West. No, but they didn't throw stones at you. No. Okay? They will, if you drive into their neighborhood, because you're not supposed to drive on the Sabbath, okay, They'll, people will throw rocks at your car, all right, screaming, Shabbos, Shabbos, Shabbos which means Sabbath with an Ashkenazi Jewish accent. And we, sometimes, we, we drive on the Sabbath sometimes. We take our kids. We might go to the beach. We do something fun. Uh, we have people walk by in the neighborhood, and they look at us, and they say, Shabbos, Shabbos, Shabbos. Okay? This is our people. This is what is, it was like back then. In some ways, it may have even gotten, you know, tradition and rules only grow, you know. It's like the American legal system, you know. It never shrinks. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more lawyers, right? I hope there's, I know there's some lawyers. We love them. We bless them. There just may be a few too many, that's all. Um, too much of a good thing, that's what you say, right? Uh, 
So he's there, and they say, well, you're not supposed to be walking around with your pallet. And Jesus has a conversation with him, and then he declares at the end, when he confronts the Pharisees, he says these simple words. My father is working until now, and I myself am working. Hello, he's saying, you guys have totally misunderstood the Sabbath. What did you think? That God's resting? That every seven days he goes on a kind of vacation? The God whose word sustains the whole universe? Folks, if God really rests and goes on vacation, we're all going to be sucked into a black hole or something like that. All right? The world is going to cease to be. His word is a lie. Let there be light is still working. That word, it's working. He's speaking, okay? He says, you guys, you guys have missed it. My father's working. He's doing work. Don't think that Genesis chapter 2, which we base our Sabbath observance on, where it says that on the seventh day God finished all of his works and he Sabbathed and he sanctified the seventh. That's all wonderful. And it's wonderful to take a seventh day, all those good things. But don't think that God's on vacation. He's not resting. He's still working. So am I and so are we. Amen? It's good to do that again. I haven't done that for 10 months. Amen, and people are actually saying amen, even a few people. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's turn to Hebrews 3. Um, and that's where I want to spend a, the, almost the rest of the time, and a good chunk, because it's, it's meaty. You know, the book of Hebrews is real meat. It's a big steak that is chewy sometimes. Uh, we love it during this season by the way, in our congregation, we have a tradition on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of, of the Jewish calendar. Uh, we come together, it's fasting and praying. We read through the whole book of Hebrews uh, because it speaks so many different ways of how the new covenant fits with the old, how it fulfills, how Jesus is high, greater than the angels, greater than Moses, etc., etc. Um, but here in these verses, starting in chapter 3, verse 12, until the end of chapter 4. The scripture, I almost said Paul, but if I say that, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. There's a lot of different opinions about that, but I believe that he's the only one who could have this stuff in his head um, and understand the, the scriptures to such a depth. Uh, so I'll say, if I say Paul said, you'll understand what I'm talking about. <clears throat> you don't have to believe that. It's okay. Uh, he starts this teaching about the Sabbath, which remember we're talking about Sabbath and feast, they go together, um, with something from Psalm, a basically a kind of interpretation, a preaching from Psalm 95. Uh, and that's where I want you to turn to next because I want, that's, that's the essence of, of Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 is based on this. And I just want to read this psalm because it is a psalm, at least for the first six and a half verses, of worship, of adoration, of praise, doing what much of the book of Psalms does and what God's people have always done, like we just did this morning with music, worship, praise, lifting our hands, speaking, declaring how great God is. Okay, Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountain are also his. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Amen? Beautiful, amazing worship, praise of God. And then something totally different happens. Today, 
If you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, truly they shall not enter into my rest. Do you see what happened? Whoever wrote this psalm, whether it was David, someone else, they're worshiping. And then suddenly God is speaking in the first person. Suddenly the spirit of prophecy has been activated. And in this case, the hammer comes down. It's a very, very severe prophecy. I just, this is kind of a side note. I know what you were doing during the 10 days and what you believe in, what we believe in here at Wellspring Church and, and all over the world. The connection between worship and praise and prophecy. Yeah? The, 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 the music, the singing, it's not just something to get, warm you up, you know, before the message. Maybe that's sort of it's in the old school. It's to stir up our, our souls, our connection with God, and then prophecy. The brother who was leading worship, he started, what is it? He's alive, he's alive, he's alive. Yeah? Declaring something prophetic. And you go, oh, yeah, and someone else is coming for. I know we, people start bringing words. Yeah? God starts to connect things, to connect the dots suddenly in new ways. That's the spirit of prophecy. It's been called harp and bowl, right? I think IHOP started that, yeah? The harp of, of worship and music and the bowl of intercession and of prophecy, okay? These things go together. And it's amazing, in the book of Hebrews, nowhere else in the New Testament does it do this. The Psalms are central. I don't know what percentage, 70% maybe, of the words of God from the Old Testament that the book of Hebrews is, is bringing out for us are prophecies from the Psalms. Psalm this is 95, there's Psalm 110, Psalm 8, Psalm 2, all the, just come out. It's amazing to see that connection from the book of Psalms between worship and prophecy right into our own living rooms. Okay, so let's, let's uh, look, at the, look at these verses. The first, the connection, the, the, the transition, if you will, for Paul or for the writer of Hebrews uh, begins in, in chapter 3, verse 12. He's just taught about Moses, how Jesus is, is superior to the angels, superior to Moses. And then he says, take care, brethren. This is how it is in Hebrews. He does a teaching, and then he preaches. He says, okay, now this is, watch out. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Lest there should be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is called today, lest any, any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's the connection, is the today. Remember, that's how in the second part of verse 7 in chapter 95, that's how this prophecy begins. Today. And he's going to make a big deal about the timing of that today. Okay? And then he continues and starts quoting Psalm 95 today, uh, verse 14. For if we've become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they pro provoked me. So the question for, for, for Paul here, the, or Hebrews, is, well, when is this today? Yeah. And he says, well, wait a minute. The psalmist, when the psalmist was writing, let's say it's King David, he's writing about, Four, 500, 600 years after Moses, right? And there was this promise that God gave to the children of Israel during the time of Moses. If they're obedient, they will enter into the promised land, enter into his rest, right? But they didn't. They were judged because of their unbelief. They weren't, not even Moses was allowed to enter because of the waters of Meribah. That was Moses' great mistake, his great sin. And God judged him and said, even you, Moses, will not enter uh, the promised land, enter this rest, okay? 
Um, he says, let's, let's go forward to Hebrews uh, chapter 4 now, verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 8. And he says, For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Okay? Who would not have spoken? The psalmist. The psalmist is saying, today, everybody, today, 500 years after Moses, five, 600 years after Joshua, today, if you'll hear his voice, there's a promise, there's a rest, there's a promised land, there's a Sabbath for you to enter, okay? And the writer of Hebrews says, for, look, Joshua, if Joshua had given them rest, yeah, Joshua brought them into the promised land. But there was a lot of warfare, and, and things were, never went that smoothly, right? There were victories, there were defeats, and then there's the book of Judges, and all of the ups and downs, a lot of downs, then there's Samuel and the kings, and wonderful things, eventually judgment and exile for the Jewish people. In verses 3 and 4 of chapter 4, this is also a key kind of... Uh, almost a trick that for us in, in Hebrew is very interesting. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, where Paul connects Psalm 95 to the Sabbath and to Genesis. Okay? This is Hebrews 4, verses 3 and 4. For we who have believed enter that rest, the rest that's promised in Psalm 95 that was promised to Moses, that was promised to the children of Israel. Just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has thus said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. I said it's interesting in Hebrew. In English, it's all the same word, rest. In Psalm 95, the word is one word, menucha. And in Genesis and in the command in Exodus, it's the word Sabbath. He Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. So if you're reading in Hebrew, you, don't, um, you wouldn't have made this connection. And the rabbis never made this connection between Psalm 95 and the Sabbath. Do you understand what I'm saying? A little complicated. But if you're reading Psalm 95... He, and now the psalmist is talking about what happened in the days of Moses and Joshua. And God is speaking first person and says, and I swore in my wrath to that generation, they will not enter my rest. You're thinking, oh, yeah, he said they're not going to enter the Holy Land. Okay, symbolically, the rest of the Holy Land. They've been wandering. They were slaves, wandering for 40 years. Now they're going to have some rest there in the Holy Land, in the Promised Land. That's not the Sabbath, Right? But here the Holy Spirit in Hebrews makes this connection quickly, very quickly, between in verses 3 and 4. They shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundations of the world. That takes us to Genesis. He said somewhere concerning, not somewhere, I don't know why he said somewhere. We all know it's Genesis 2. Concerning the seventh day, and God rested. He Sabbathed on the seventh day from all of his works. Okay? So, here, let's just kind of put this all together, okay? We have in Genesis chapter 2, after the six days of creation, after making man in his image finally, after giving us dominion, calling us to rule and reign with him, be his stewards over all the creation, the statement that then comes the seventh day when God completed all of his works. And he Sabbathed, and he made this Sabbath day holy. Okay? What does that mean? Later in Exodus, in the Ten Commandments, the commandment comes to the children of Israel in light of, Gen in light of Genesis 2, what God did. He rested on the Sabbath day, the command for us to keep the Sabbath because God made the world in six days. We're supposed to remember this. Okay? And we're supposed to understand something. John chapter 5, what we read, comes along to the Jewish people. 
And the Jewish people, remember, we developed until this day a whole philosophy, a whole lifestyle based around the Sabbath. I can't express it to you. If you want to know, come to Israel and stay for a few weeks, especially in Jerusalem or some of the, where there's other towns where there's a lot of Orthodox Jews, and see what happens on the Sabbath. On the one hand, it's beautiful. Everything stops. People don't go shopping. Stores are closed. Buses don't run, at least in Jerusalem. Now they're running in Tel Aviv. It's a big controversy. Okay? There's all these rules and all these things. It's a time of family. It's a time of getting together, good food. You dress up. Wonderful. Nice and very nice things. On the other hand, I've found after living in Jerusalem for uh, since 98, how long is that? 22 years? Off and on. Um, it's also spiritually one of the darkest times and most difficult, spiritu spiritually difficult times of the week. Okay? Why? Because I see what happens to my neighbors. I have neighbors uh, who are, a lot of neighbors who are mildly traditional Jews. Okay? You would not call them orthodox. They're not particularly religious. If you ask them, they don't believe in God. Okay? They believe in being Jewish and you're supposed to keep the traditions. Nice people. We have nice relationship during the week. When the Sabbath comes, they put on a, they start walking around like this. Suddenly, there's judgment in the air. Okay? There's this spirit of, I'm doing what we're supposed to be doing. Are you? I'm, this is what the rabbi is looking around, judging themselves and judging one another. Okay? You feel it. I, my wife and I have noticed for years we'll have arguments, things on this. I think, God, this is supposed to be this wonderful day. What's happening? But the darkness of religion, that same spirit of the Pharisees 2,000 years ago, that instead of rejoicing with this man who had just been healed after being lame for 38 years, says, you know, you're not supposed to carry your pallet on the Shabbat. Think about that. It's a dark thing. And our people have made a mystical thing. There are mystical traditions and songs that are sung about the special uh, I don't know, there's not even words for it. Special atmosphere, the special spirituality that begins at Friday night at 5.38 p.m. Whatever time of year, that's when the Sabbath begins. You know, it changes throughout with the going down of the sun. That something happens and you enter into this totally like different space. Yeah? And Jesus comes along in John 5 and says, no, 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 guys. You totally misunderstood. There's works of God. The works of God, of healing, of preaching, of walking around. Jesus didn't go out of his way to open up his father's carpentry shop on, on the Sabbath. Okay, he wouldn't do that. But he did go preaching the good news. He did go healing. He let his, his disciples pick grain on the, on the Sabbath. Okay? He knew what was, where, where God's priorities were. Yeah? And then we come <clears throat> to Hebrews. And he connects this worship of Psalm 95, this prophecy of Psalm 95, this promise of today. And he says, the Sabbath of God, when is it? When is it? Today. What time? Now. By faith. You want to enter into that place where God is from Genesis 2, this day that he sanctified, this place of his enjoying his creation, where he's still working, John chapter 5. He's doing a lot, just like Jesus is doing and the Holy Spirit is doing a lot today, right? But we can enter into that place. When? Today. So the timing of God, when is it? Now. And brothers and sisters, I want to say this to you. Be careful. There's some of the teaching out there. 
about the feasts and the Sabbaths will kind of either subtly suggest or very clearly proclaim that by keeping something, you can enter into a certain kind of special time with God where maybe there's a, or maybe or definitely depends who's teaching it, there's some, you have, there's some like opening to get something or have something in your relationship with God that you couldn't have at another time. Has anyone ever heard anything like that? Hebrews 3 and 4, I'm not, I hope you see it. It just takes the ax to the, to the root of that, of that whole mindset. Takes the ax to the root of, of the auspicious timing of, of when is the angel going to stir up the water so we can get healed. Jesus comes along and says, now, now, now. The timing of God, the day of salvation, the day of grace is today. It's now. It's always been. But even more so under the new covenant in Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So I hope you can hear that today. And it's not just because it's Sunday and because we're preaching. That's a good thing. And it's a good thing that we have a Sunday. And it's a good thing that there's a Sabbath. And the good thing that there's feasts to help us remember and to stir us up. Okay? But don't get mixed up. Watch out for the religious spirit. Okay? That comes along and says, Aha, because we're doing this, because we're keeping this, then that's why God is doing it. No, no, no. Anytime. Today. Now is the time. So in conclusion, I asked the question at the beginning, are we supposed to keep the feasts? Did I answer it? Sort of. It's a whole other teaching, maybe, about how and why there is a keeping or not a keeping. But I'll say this today. First and foremost, now, today, we are free, always by faith, in the name of Jesus. That's the whole book of Hebrews, the high priest, the new and living way straight into the sanctuary of God. Now, today, we have access, okay? There's no more auspicious timing. You know, the world is full of auspicious timings. My, you know, I've, I studied Japan and China and traditional religions over there are full of things about timing, and good luck. Do this on this day. Don't do this on this day. It's like your horoscope. This is a good month for this. This is not a good month for this. Da, 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 da. That's auspicious timing. No more. No more. For us, by faith, it's now. It's today. Okay? So is there a keeping? What does it mean? Let me say, just close by saying this. The principle is this. Does it help you? If keeping this a Sabbath... Saturday, Sunday, Friday, right? If observing a feast, whether it's the biblical ones, whether it's Christmas, however it works, is it helping you to do what, what Hebrews is saying today? Getting into that place of, of, of rest, of this, of this working restfully and resting workfully that is the essence of God and the essence of our life with God. I just want to close with reading these scriptures at the end of, of uh, or towards the end of chapter 4. Um, verse 9. 9 through 11. I'm just going to read these and then pray. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest, his Sabbath, has himself also rested from his work, as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. And verse 12, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Father, we thank you for your word. 
and that it is a double-edged sword, that it cuts this way and it cuts that way. It cuts into our religiosity about the Sabbath and the rest, and it cuts into our capacity to depend on our own works, on our own fleshly mind, on our own ideas. And it brings us into this perfect balance where you are, who you are. Lord, help us during this season and all the time to enter into this today by faith, this place of joining you, of joining Jesus, that we will say, my Father is working until now, and so am I. I'm doing His works, and His works are now. They're today. And Lord, help us also to understand the timing, the calendar, all of its prophetic meanings. The celebration of them can help us to do that. There's wonderful things there. But Lord, save us from any deception of religiosity, of thinking that because it's this day or this time that something special is going to happen. Lord, we want to be people of the now. We want to be people when we're walking down the street, when we're in the supermarket, wherever we are, that we're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit who's saying, now, 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 speak to that person. Now, pray for these people. Now, pray. Now, do this. All from the place of Sabbathing in our hearts, of peace, of rest in our hearts, without the striving of human works. Help us, Lord. B'Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ariel. Um, just want to say a couple things before I release this with a benediction. Um, just occurs to me, those of you who have been listening online, those of you who are here, you've just experienced what Ephesians 4 talks about as the office of the teacher. And uh, we want to honor your gift. And I know that you've cultivated it with great diligence. We've just received a word of extraordinary, um, Debbie says I shouldn't use words like this, but I can't come up with a synonym, profundity. Great depth and great clarity. That's what the office of the teacher does. And um, just pray blessing and increase on you, Ariel, and on that word because we need it. Also, as uh, I picked up the mic, I felt like the Lord just gave me a, a little spark prophetically for you. I don't have a whole lot to this, and it's not a new word. It's not even necessarily a great surprise, but... The Lord just wants me to remind you that although this, your sojourn here to the States came as a surprise, it's a divine appointment. And my heart and thoughts immediately went to your family, prayed for your mom over the years, for Eddie, for your family, and I know you're always uh, sensitive to that. Uh, but I just felt it, uh, like don't, like press in. So I want us to pray for Ariel uh, and for his family. Lord, I thank you for our friend. Thank you for your servant and your son. And I do pray, Lord, for every divine appointment that you have for him while he's here in Connecticut. Uh, they do not know yet, Lord, when they're going to return. But I pray that it's a now time and that the whole season that he and Verid and the children are here in Connecticut, that every day is a today of opportunity. And I lift up his mom and his siblings, and I pray for great conversations, open hearts, open ears, that the Word of God would be living and active in their receiving it, that it might, Lord, bear fruit even unto eternal life. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Now, I'm going to invite you, those of you who are here to stand, I want to release a benediction upon you and also upon those of you at home. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.